In the Principia, Newton spelt out the laws of motion, but his greatest achievement was the universal law of gravity. This is saying that something on one end of the universe, billions of miles away, actually exerts an attraction through all the intervening material on one tiny particle on the other side of the universe. And that, that is an extraordinary thought. And in my view and the view of everybody else who's looked at it, uh, there is simply nothing like that in physics up to that point. As far as the natural world went, he did have a unified vision. And even in the Principia, we find the Sal Nitrum, the Niter theory, where he says that the tails of comets sink down to the Earth and then are somehow buoyed back up into the outer reaches of space and eventually serve as the food of the sun that allows it to continue to burn. So he was thinking in terms of this circulation theory, even at the time of composing and revising the Principia. The 1687 edition of the Principia only contains one reference to God as creator. But in later editions, Newton stressed the all-powerful role of God in his universe. The most beautiful system of the sun, planets and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. God therefore placed the planets at different distances from the sun, so that according to their degrees of density, they may enjoy a greater or lesser proportion of the sun's heat. He mocked scientists like Descartes, who saw an inert, godless world. Were men and beasts made by fortuitous jumblings of atoms, there have been many parts useless in them. Here a lump of flesh, there a member too much. Some kinds of beasts might have had but one eye, some more than two. Atoms, mechanical laws and nothing when compared to the knowledge and wisdom of the Creator. He moved permanently from the cloisters of Trinity to London. Newton now sought and gained money and power. He became president of the Royal Society and master of the Royal Mint, where he earned a fortune. But all the time, he guarded his dark secrets right up to his death in 1727, he tried to keep his heresy as secret as possible because the vast majority of people around him are orthodox Anglicans. And he thinks, there's no point trying to convince these people of, of what I'm doing because the time is not right. These people aren't fit to receive uh, the kind of word that I'm giving out. As he lay dying, Sir Isaac Newton, aged 84, finally revealed his double life. He made clear to startled friends the dangerous heretical belief that he had kept secret for 50 years. He refused to take the last sacrament. Sir Isaac, that was the time for the last sacrament. No. I will not die in the embrace of a corrupt church. I have made my peace with God. Lies evidence of the scale of deception that has been perpetrated on generations. He researched the history of Christianity and became convinced that both the Catholic and the Anglican Church were founded on a corruption of the word of God. Now, because Newton was so convinced that God is extremely powerful and unique, Newton begins to minimize, to play down, eventually. 
essentially to deny the divinity of Christ. And Newton comes to the conclusion very early on that the Trinity is a blasphemy on the first commandment because the first commandment says that thou shalt have no other gods before me and the worship of the Father, Son and Holy Ghost from Newton's point of view is a heresy. We can see page after page of uh, material in which he tries to argue that the early church fathers, they're actually villains, uh, they're criminals, and in some cases he actually calls them murderers for some of the things that they have done. And they left all the commandments of the Lord their God, and made them molten images, even to calves, and made it grow, and worshipped all the hosts of heaven, and served Baal. Newton became convinced God foresaw that the Catholics would corrupt pure Christianity, that he would be tormented for the rest of his life. Should he stay silent or denounce the corruption of the Anglican Church publicly? If the Trinity is still here, so is the Antichrist. It's not something you can just sort of shrug off and say, oh, I'll deal with that tomorrow. It's not something that goes away when you go to sleep. It's going to haunt the dream.